Okay, well, thank you everyone. I'm Kate Barlow, host of the International Mentorship Program. And today we have Dr. Ann Escher, and she's going to be talking to us about aphasia. Hi, Ann, thank you for coming. Hello, thanks for having me. Um, thank you, and thank you for those of you who are on the um, presentation right now. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name, as Dr. Barlow said, is Ann Escher, and um, I'm a clinical assistant professor at Boston University. Um, and I'm talking to you today about um, working with people with aphasia because my recent clinical and research interests have been surrounding including people with aphasia in um, uh, assessment and in intervention. Um, so I also on this slide you'll see I have with thanks to Sue Berger and I want to say that um, most of this work has been done with my colleague Sue Berger. Um, so I want to thank her publicly for all of her contributions to this presentation. Um, so my goals for this webinar um, is to ensure that you're going to be able to describe some of the challenges for participation for adults who have communication impairments and to be able to demonstrate some strategies um, that you can use to help support this population um, participate in evaluation and intervention. Please feel free to ask questions at any point. Kate. Dr. Barlow assured me that she will be in charge of the chat box and feel free to unmute and ask any questions. So to start, I want you to imagine yourself a day without communication. So, you know, your alarm goes off and you need to get up, but you can't really understand your clock. Um, you go to the bathroom to take your medication and you can't understand the dosage instructions, um, you, you start to talk to your household, whoever's in your household or roommate, and you don't understand what they're saying. Um, really, and all of these challenges could happen before you even leave for the day. So communication really imbues so many of our daily occupations. Um, so in the United States, we use the occupational therapy practice framework as a framework for understanding um, having a shared language in how we talk about occupation and our um, practice. And in the OT practice framework, um, communication management is defined and it's considered an instrumental activity of daily living. And so here's the definition from the OTPF. Sending, receiving, and interpreting information using a variety of systems and equipment, including writing tools, telephones, keyboards, audiovisual recorders, et cetera, et cetera, um, and augmentative communication systems and personal digital assistance. So that's one definition. And I also like to look at the, um, that, that helps me think about communication, is um, the American Speech Hearing Association's definition of communication, which is forms of behavior that express needs, wants, feelings, and preferences that others can understand. Um, so these two definitions together really help me to understand what we're talking about when we talk about communication. It's not just the sending, receiving, and interpreting of information through multiple systems, but also doing so in a way that others can understand. So, you know, I, I'm talking about communication impairments here, and communication impairments can be both or either speech disorders or language disorders. And here on this slide are a couple of examples of both. Um, speech disorders are ones that have to do with the production of speech through planning or muscle weakness, whereas language disorders result from damage to the brain's language areas, which results in challenges with expressive, and receptive communication. Um, so during this presentation, I'll mostly be referring to aphasia throughout this webinar, um, as it's a very common language disorder that can occur post-stroke or after traumatic brain injury. Um, it's important to note here that aphasia is a language impairment, and you know, there can be difficulty understanding other people or expressing themselves but it's not a cognitive impairment by itself. Aphasia is just a language impairment. As we know, many people who have had a stroke also end up with cognitive impairments, but aphasia by itself 
is strictly a language um, impairment. So the literature makes it clear that people with communication impairments have decreased participation outcomes, not just in everyday activities, but they also experience difficulties engaging in therapy itself. Um, additionally, because of the challenges of working with people with communication impairments, people with aphasia are often left out of research. And you may have noticed that yourself if you've read studies about people post-stroke. Oftentimes, um, having aphasia is an exclusion criterion. So there's less research about people post-stroke because even the stroke research often doesn't include them. Um, so people with communication impairments are left out of participation in therapy and decision making sometimes. Um, one researcher suggested that this is because practitioners, OT practitioners and other practitioners, um, may not recognize how best to engage the clients. In addition, practitioners may feel overwhelmed with how best to support clients in goal setting and intervention. And so practitioners rely just on their own clinical judgment uh, to make decisions about occupational therapy. But the research has also shown that people with communication impairments often have goals that aren't addressed in maybe traditional rehabilitation settings. Um, I want to make it clear here that occupational therapists screen clients for occupational performance difficulties related to communication challenges, but it's not in our scope to evaluate their actual communication ability. Um, what we look at in assessment and evaluation is how communication impairment is impacting participation and engagement in occupation. And, um, you know, if you Think about it again, thinking about your own day, um, communication imbues so many different occupations, including um, social participation, work, uh, leisure activities, um, just getting, going through your, doing your household, household daily chores, even if you're doing them with other people. Um, so to start with, I'd like to talk a little bit about outcome measures and assessment with people with communication impairments. Um, so, you know, of course, oftentimes when we are working with a client and we're with them for the first time, we're looking at how they were observing them doing things. Um, so many of our assessments uh, look at someone doing an activity and then we check off how they're doing or what level of assistance they might need. But some information actually needs to come from the client themselves because it's not observed. Um, so pain level, fatigue, and other aspects of health and wellness, um, such as quality of life or frequency of activity in their daily lives, um, we can't observe. Um, so we have to rely on people telling us what they're being able to report their own experiences. Um, and additionally, um, the oftentimes people with communication impairments, we might rely on family members or friends to give us a report of how they're doing. Um, but research has shown that oftentimes, and it's called proxy report, oftentimes, um, the proxy actually offers a more negative bias towards people's quality of life, towards their um, overall health, their level of pain, their physical functioning. They'll actually skew it more negative than the person with aphasia would have or with a communication impairment would have themselves. So it's important for us to try to get at these patient reported outcomes, get at what the client is actually feeling. So again, my colleague Sue Berger and I um, looked at universal design for learning, health literacy principles, and a review of the literature. And we synthesized best we could some of the best practice strategies for adapting outcome measures for people with aphasia. And we try to synthesize it into these six key principles. 
Um, I'm going to talk about some of the evidence for each of these principles and share a couple of examples of modifications that you can use. Um, I, they're not in any order of priority. They're all important. Um, and you'll see that there's a lot of overlap between these principles, um, but it just helps us to provide a structure for thinking about how to work with people with communication impairments. And I want to say that these were um, created in order to help you think about modifying outcome measures and standardized outcome measures, but you can think about it with for almost any written materials you're providing and even some of the interventions. And I will be talking about interventions towards the end of the talk. So principle number one is um, thinking about vocabulary and syntax. Um, that means like your phrasing in general. So first let's start with vocabulary. In the United States, most health education materials are written at a grade 10 readability. Um, but for people with aphasia and people with low, lower literacy and even for people who are stressed or in pain, it's recommended to make written material at a fifth grade reading level. Um, so the main way to decrease the reading level is through the use of words and sentence structure. So using simple words that are one or two syllables and shorter sentences generally decreases the reading level. Um, I wanna here mention a resource, I've got the citation for it later in the PowerPoint um, from the United Kingdom that is a set of guidelines for making information accessible for people with aphasia. And if you have only time to read one document related to this kind of work for this population, it's a good one because it's a great overview. Um, the guidelines are specific to people with aphasia, but the suggestions are very relevant and appropriate for others who struggle with communication um, for many reasons. Um, I'm bringing it up here because the guidelines provide some suggested strategies that fit into this category of vocabulary and syntax. They emphasize only including information that is needed, cutting out anything superfluous. Uh, definitely don't ramble, as I often do, um, but rather be succinct as possible, provide one message at a time, and make sure that the messages are in a logical order. Um, people with aphasia also often struggle with pronouns, and so it's suggested to limit the use of pronouns when possible. It's better to use names in, instead of pronouns. The next principle is about the presentation of the materials themselves. Um, even if you're reading questions to the client, it's ideal to also have a visual for them to look at, um, to follow along. And how you present that information is important and can make a big difference to the client's comprehension of the material. People with aphasia prefer large fonts and sans serif font. That means it's the fonts that are very plain, like this one that I used for this presentation. Not the Times New Roman, not the ones with any squiggles at the ends or fancy looking writing. Um, it makes it much easier. They prefer it. People with aphasia prefer that kind of font and they comprehend more um, with that kind of font. Um, this Brennan study that I have um, here uh, looked at the comprehension of people with mild to moderate aphasia and they were three to 11 years post-stroke. And the study participants understood written material better with large font, sans serif, and increased white space on the page. Um, they compared each feature separately and then combined. And there was a significant improvement in comprehension even when just one feature was changed of these. For example, just making the font larger increased the client's comprehension. Um, so that's an important message, I think, that even trying at least one piece could help your client's comprehension. All right, the other thing for presentation is using a good layout, quote, good layout. Um, that means, again, giving plenty of white space, using a font at least 14, but ideally higher. Um, again, using a sans serif, font using sentence case. So if you capitalize for emphasis 
um, all of the letters in um, a word, if you think about, say, the words and and for, and if they're both capital, all capitals, they're both just little rectangles. It's really hard for someone with aphasia or who has someone who has difficulty reading to differentiate and take some cues, some visual cues from the word to figure out what it says. So it's better to use sentence case. So capitalizing the first word and the first letter of any you know, proper nouns, but otherwise um, emphasizing with either bold or an underline. And not underline, sorry, just bold. <laughs> Um, so I want to look at an example of uh, an assessment. It's an outcome measure called the Stroke Impact Scale. And I want to think about these two first principles in relationship to this, um, the Stroke Impact Scale. Um, this scale measures an individual's perception of the impact of a stroke on their health and well-being and their functional status, sorry. We, I've used this message, um, this measure in an interdisciplinary um, program that we ran for people with aphasia, and we ran it with physical therapy, nutrition, and speech therapy. And so we used this as an interprofessional um, outcome measure. So I'm using this. It's also uh, widely available, and I, I also have this as a resource for you at the end. So this is the paragraph that's included in the stroke impact scale that's to be read to clients. So I want you to look at this paragraph. You don't have to read every word right now, but based on some of the things that I just talked about, think about how you might change this in order to increase comprehension and readability. And I'll read it out loud. The purpose of this questionnaire is to evaluate how stroke has impacted your health and life. We want to know from your point of view how stroke has affected you. We will ask you questions about impairments and disabilities caused by your stroke, as well as how stroke has affected your quality of life. Finally, we will ask you to rate how much you think you have recovered from your stroke. So that's it's great. It's the assessment. Um, for people with aphasia, however, or other communication impairments, this this could be a lot. Um, so first of all, let's look at the presentation. Um, as I was just saying, there's a piece here that's all in capital and underlined. Um, oh, sorry, I have an example of what we could do instead. So we switch that to bolded and sentence case. Um, we also use a sans serif font instead of the um, font that was used initially. And we used um, fewer words and tried to make it much simpler to understand. Um, so an alternative might be, we want to know from your point of view, how stroke has impacted your health and life. Please answer the following questions. So much more succinct, concise, and pretty much saying pretty close to the same thing. So this is um, the, uh, an example of part of one of the um, scales. So there's a, a section on each page, and this is the section for ADL, IADL. It's a piece of the section, um, just to give you an example of what it looks like. Again, at this, think about what you might do to modify this to ensure that a client with a communication impairment can understand this assessment. Think about that for a minute, how it's set up. And this is an example of some modifications that we've used. Um, for one thing, changing the question, changing the format to be one question per section. So in this case, in the original case, they have the following questions ask you, and then it lists A, B, C, D, E, F, G. In this case, we're asking this, the question in individually with the scale individually. In the past two weeks, how difficult was it to cut your food with a knife and fork? So um, one item per area with the scale repeated, sans serif again font, we highlighted two weeks and cut your food. And the other um, subtle change, but possibly an important one, is that if you look at the original, um, the five is on the left side of the paper, not difficult at all. 
and the one is on the right side of the paper, could not do it all. And that's fine, um, but most of the time when we're giving, providing a Likert scale, and most of our clients are most used to seeing from one to five or one to 10. So in this case, we actually switched it around. It still means the same thing. The one means the same thing, but it's on the left side of the page. One could not do it at all to five, not difficult at all. So we, it all means the same, each number means the same thing, but we just switched the orientation. All right, so principle three is using pictures. And um, 90, so in one study, um, Regarding preference, regarding pictures, most people with communication challenges think pictures are helpful um, and help support their comprehension. A few people think they're childish as well. So um, it's not always perfect. Um, when asking for a preference about the type of picture, the majority of individuals preferred actual photographs. But in terms of comprehension, it doesn't make a difference if there is a photograph or a line drawing. Um, the comprehension is increased with either. Um, it is worth keeping in mind that even these studies that are of people with aphasia, it was just people with mild to moderate aphasia, not the severest forms. Um, so they actually exclude people with the most severe communication impairments. And, um, those are the people who might benefit the most from, from photos or pictures. So more research is needed to determine that. Um, so here's some um, ideas for using pictures. Use clear, good quality pictures if you can. Um, pictures that are made for adults, not childish looking pictures. Um, pictures that show meaning, not decorations. So that's also, um, if you have, if you're asking someone about how they brush their teeth, and you've just got a picture of a toothbrush, that's okay, it's better than nothing. But if you've got a picture of someone with a toothbrush and the toothbrush is you know, in their mouth, that's better, it gives a little more context. But then if you also have like, there are pictures behind the person and there's decorations, then that becomes distracting. Um, so you have to sort of balance that. Um, so the ultimately use pictures, but use them carefully. Principle number four is to provide choices. Um, and when giving choices to clients with aphasia, it's actually best to give one message at a time if possible. Um, so, you know, usually we might couple two things together, like do you begin your day on getting dressed or having breakfast? And it's two things in one sentence, which is how we typically give choices. But for people with aphasia or other communication impairments, sometimes it's even better to do one at a time. So did you, um, do you start your day uh, having breakfast? Yes or no? Then do you start your day um, getting washed up? Yes or no? Um, also, if you're using Likert scales, which provides a choice. Um, sometimes it can be helpful to limit the number of choices. So Likert scales often go from one to 10, but sometimes we might make the scale one to five. And asking close-ended questions is actually very helpful for um, people with aphasia for their comprehension. Um, principle five is supported conversation. What we mean by that is that um, OT, the OT provides some support to the participant for their understanding. So for instance, um, Francis Tucker, who is a speech language pathologist, along with um, some occupational therapists, including Lisa Connor and Carolyn Baum and some others, they adapted four measures to make them accessible for people with aphasia and tested them for validity and reliability. They grouped their adaptations into presentation, which included many of the features we discussed earlier, and then hierarchical support by the examiner. And that's what we're talking about here. Um, and they found that with sufficient support for understanding questions, people with aphasia are able to participate in self-report assessments. Um, in their study, they provided scaled levels of support based on the particular needs of the individual. So for instance, they would read the question once. If they needed more support, they'd reread the question. 
then they might simplify and restate the question in a different way. Um, for the choice scale, they would um, explain, re-explain the choice scale it's done on its scale from one to 10. And then they might say one being you don't do it at all to 10 doing, being you do it a lot or that sort of thing. And then if they needed even more support, they would change the question to yes, no. I'm just gonna close my window, excuse me. I think that might've been loud. Um, some other strategies to support comprehension are, are, might be clearer to you uh, in terms of using a sl slower pace, using a natural voice, using gestures by pointing, demonstrating, um, making sure to, and, and making sure to verify comprehension. So both that the person with impaired communication understands you, but also as importantly, that you understand the person. Um, <clears throat> and one way to do that is a teach back technique where the client, this is a way that's advocated in the health literacy um, literature, and it's having the client re-explain or demonstrate what you just said, or um, try to explain it to someone else, um, or, uh, explain it to someone else or in their own words. Um, you can use a trial or sample question. You ask a question when you know the answer, and so and it has a little more of a right or wrong answer. And um, for example, how much do you use your right arm to wash your hair when, if you knew already that the arm was essentially um, paralyzed? So probably not a lot. Um, if they gave it a different, um, answer than you expected, you might understand that they didn't understand the question. Um, the final principle is called is environment. And this one is something we should be doing, you know, all the time. Um, always best uh, to participate with uh, people with communication impairments face to face if possible. And um, phone interviews are harder for people with communication um, impairments. It's also really helpful to always have writing material available. Um, people with aphasia sometimes may not be able to say something, but they may be able to write or draw um, an answer. And allowing enough time, and this can be one of the trickiest pieces uh, when you're an occupational therapist and you're going from patient to patient and you need to be moving um, to give them time to answer the questions. Um, so let's look at an assessment um, that's often used um, by OTs, but um, can be hard to use with people with communication impairments. And we'll look at some modifications too. Just a reminder, you guys can interrupt Anne at any time if you have a question or you can type it in the chat box and I, and I will answer it for you, okay? Thanks. All right. um, so now we're going to talk about the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure. Um, this is a standardized outcome measure. It's structured as a semi-structured interview. Um, it elicits a client's self-perception of their level of performance and their satisfaction of that performance of daily activities. After the client chooses five activities that are the most important or the most challenging to them, the participant rates their performance and satisfaction with their performance on a 10-point Likert scale. So this is what the Likert scale looks like. Uh, that comes in the COPM kit. It's, the question is, how would you rate the way you do this activity now? And it, this is what the scale looks like, not able to do it to able to do it extremely well. And this is the satisfaction scale. How satisfied are you with the way you do this activity now? From one not satisfied at all to 10 extremely satisfied. This um, assessment provides a lot of room for modifications to increase the understanding for a person with um, impaired communication. For one thing, using photographs. And so when we've used this assessment in a community-based setting, we um, use either photographs 
from assessments that we have already that might have photos of different ADLs. And then we supplement those photos with either photographs we've taken or um, widely available um, stock photos from the internet. And we try to use photos that relate to the population, what we know about them and what might be typical um, occupational performance issues they might be having. So for instance, the, the population that we work with, usually um, they're generally pretty independent with basic ADLs, but some of the more specifics like clipping nails or flossing teeth might be especially challenging. So you could build your own set of photos or pictures um, of typical activities for your specific context and population. So these are some of the ways that we um, did adaptations to the rating scales, and I'm going to show you examples of them. So this is one. Um, I always would have the photo or the picture of the activity that the client was rating and then the scale in front of them and ask them, how good are you at this activity? Not good or very good? And you might notice some of the changes I made to the scale. Um, the presentation, for sure. Larger font, fewer numbers. Um, numbers can be tricky for people with communication impairments, so sometimes it's better to just have the two on the ends. Using slash marks can decrease some of the confusion, and they can just point, and then you as the administr administrator can say, oh, that was a five. I know I can count the um, flash marks. Um, and the question. We altered the wording of the question a little bit um, from how would you rate the way you do this activity to now to how good are you at this activity. Another modified scale is um, this one that obviously the major difference is that it's a vertical scale. Uh, some people with aphasia post-stroke are also struggling with neglect or an inattention. And so if someone's neglecting the left side of the paper, you may be getting a skewed result that's higher than it actually would be. And so the idea with the vertical scale is that the client can take in the entire scale. In case the one is at the bottom and the 10 is at the top. We also, this is um, the performance, the satisfaction question. We altered the wording a little bit to how do you feel about how you do this activity and it's I feel fine to I do not feel fine and um, we also use smiley faces to indicate the difference between the performance of the activity to how they feel about how they do the activity um, and then this is a third modified scale how do you feel about how you do this activity and you'll notice there are no slash marks it's just a scale from one to five instead of one to 10. So not good, it's a sad face. We added in middle, an okay, and a very good, and also color coded them. So depending on your population and who you're working with, the scale, um, you might use a different scale for, for um, it's interesting. It's very much um, individual. Um, people with aphasia have their own preferences for what they think is most clear. So other um, considerations, I just want to acknowledge that I'm focusing here on assessments that are self-report of participation. And um, when measuring cognition, a lot of these supportive measures I'm talking about in adaptations are not appropriate um, because it's hard, you wouldn't be able to tell whether it was cognition or the language impairment. Um, there are a couple of resources here for um, some ideas for patient reported outcomes with people with cognitive, for people with cognitive impairments. Um, and I also just want to say we have to be very careful about how far we modify a measure and assessment and still call it by its name. Um, the validity and reliability of adapted measures could be called into question. And you just need to make sure that the modifications are explicit in your documentation if you're using a standardized assessment. So here are the six um, principles again, and we're gonna be transitioning, let's see, we started at 3.30, so okay. So we've got a few minutes to um, transition to talking about intervention. And so, um, 
The principles that I spoke about, like I said at the start, to adapt outcome measures are still very relevant to intervention. So everything I said already is still relevant to intervention with, for adults with communication impairments. Um, for example, even when you're in intervention with a client, maybe you're working on an activity of daily living, working on dressing, providing choices to the client about what they want to do, um, what they want clothes they want to wear. Um, when teaching a specific skill, asking them to show you or to explain in their own words or teach a peer. Explaining in their own words might be challenging for someone with aphasia, but um, using some level of that teach back or understanding that they know what you're saying. Um, and when you're providing any home programs or handouts, really making sure to use some of these modifications to make the written materials very clear to the people with a communication impairment. All right, so these are some key interventions that come out of the literature. And um, some of them are actually, it's speech language pathologists who uh, do the training in this intervention. But it's nice for OTs to know about it because the OT can emphasize it, can collaborate with the speech therapist on um, how to focus and things like that. So I'll get to that, but just keep that in mind that some of these, the speech therapist would do initially, and then the OT would be um, using and um, reinforcing. Um, so the first is augmentative and alternative communication. Augmentative communication supplements speech, so it's to help understanding in the speech and alternative replaces speech. Um, this refers to both, I mean, sometimes when you hear this, you might think of high tech kind of um, things, but this is really refers also to using a pen and paper. Um, Can I interrupt you real quick with a question? Absolutely. I apologize for the noise in the background. Victor has a question. Um, he's saying that he has a patient right now that he is working with. She's in her late 80s. She has rheumatoid arthritis and dementia. Mm. Um, she has also developed a hearing impairment, which means you can't use your natural tone when communicating with her. Sometimes I think that maybe this makes her think that you are shouting at her when she's looking at you. Mm. Talk to her. People home fail to understand her whether she's complaining of true pain due to arthritis or she's having an episode of a mental illness. Could tone coupled with gesture when communicating with her be affecting her negatively in any way? How best can we communicate with her? These days they are reportedly keep telling me that she only listens to me and not the family members she's staying with. How can we over overcome this? Wow. Yeah, that uh, sounds like a very challenging situation. Um, I would say in response to that first part, could tone and volume, I believe you were saying, um, impact that communication? I think it definitely could. It sounds like whatever you're doing is working. And to me, it sounds like maybe some, and we're going to get to um, some intervention strategies for where partners, communication partners are trained in how best to communicate with the client. And so it sounds like maybe some education with her family could be helpful around how to communicate it. I'm not sure if she's reading, um, but I think gestures, I think tone of voice, all of that can play in to how you're communicating and whether it's successful or not. Um, maybe she can use some uh, pictures to point. I don't, I don't know what, what might work uh, for sure, but there are certainly some things you could try. Um, I don't know if I answered all of that question, Kate. There's a lot of other Well, pieces. thank you. And um, Victor can put more questions, follow-up questions in the chat box. If okay, you okay. Thanks. So um, there's a lot of evidence that um, AAC su can support communication. Um, some people worry that the use of an augmentative communication device may impact someone's ability or um, 
their desire to try themselves to verbally communicate. But um, evidence actually shows that that's not true. It's really helpful to have both. Um, natural speech can improve when someone's using augmentative strategies as well. Um, this is one of those situations where you'd be consulting with a speech language pathologist. Um, it, here in the United States, there are more and more types of formats. Um, I think probably worldwide as well in terms of phones and tablets, although access to it could be an issue and is an issue. Um, no one's going to use any kind of communication device if they don't have good training in it and they don't understand it well. Um, so a lot of times I think, um, especially with older population, it's great to start really with like what I was saying, pictures, um, pen and pencil, encouraging them to draw, figuring out what works um, in a very low tech way. And again, we'd be consulting with speech. Um, this is a photo of uh, a client who um, he had a lot, had very limited uh, language, but he was great. He was great at drawing and getting his point across by drawing. He's using an iPad here and a stylus, but he used he used pen and paper as well. And you'll see him later in a in a little um, video. Um, so partner training, this is what I was referring to before. Uh, again, this is administered pri primarily by speech language pathologists. There's actually a strict protocol for partner training, but OTs um, should incorporate it, the strategies in with their clients and OTs are communication partners. A communication partner is anyone who the client is talking with. So that's family members, that's nurses, that's whoever they're there with. Um, it's really education and practice using all of these modalities to really help um, the client's surroundings, the other people involved with the client, to help support the client's communication, both understanding and sharing. Um, so some of those strategies to support expression, and some of these will look familiar, providing written choices, asking close-ended yes-no questions, making writing and, and drawing utensils available, listening actively, don't interrupt, um, encouraging the communication, being uh, receptive and showing through your manner that you're listening um, and trying to understand. Um, also for comprehension, using multiple modalities can help. So using pictures and gestures and words, but you also don't want to overwhelm a client with, with all of the things. Um, so <clears throat> uh, that's important to not do it all. So speaking slowly, keeping volume at a normal tone, et cetera. So this is a little video um, that I want you to see, and I want you to think about which strategies she's using. We can't hear anything. Oh, you can't. Mm -mm. I can. Hmm. Well, that's too bad. I'm not sure. Since I can hear it, I'm not sure what. Um, is what it I a mean. YouTube video? No, oh. it's an embedded video. Yeah, I'm sorry. Anyway, this is the couple. A couple who um, they've. Uh, um, the, I the, I know that if you have the video on your computer, you can play it without lagging, like this. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, not <laughs> at all. Okay, Thank Nora, you very much. Ahead. If the, if the video's on the computer, you yes. can play it. Uh -huh. I'll, you know what I'll do? I'll keep going and then I'll go back and, and see if I can do that. Let me see if I click it here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Does this, can, does this help? No, still can't hear. Okay, um, I take it you still couldn't hear it? No. Okay. okay. Um, sorry about that, everybody. I will. I will see if I can fix it after. I'm actually not sure if it's uh, 
hard on my computer too, or just in the presentation. Okay. Anyway, they're a lovely couple who she has been working with him for a long time and they've been working with therapists for many years on how to communicate. And she's trying to figure out what, what her spouse wants to get from the hardware store. And he doesn't have the word for it. And she has to keep guessing and asking questions. And then he pulls out, I can show you that part actually. Um, let me see if I can fast forward it. Here you go. So then he pulls out a, a, a paper and pen and starts to draw what he wants to get at the hardware store. She keeps asking questions. Is this for the bathroom? Is this for the um, bedroom? And they start to narrow it down and eventually figure out that it's paint. He wants to get paint for the bathroom. And she does a really masterful job of um, showing how to be supportive as a conversation partner. Um, another uh, intervention is script training that again, would probably be started by speech language pathologist, but the occupational therapist could collaborate with the speech language pathologist to think about what kinds of script should be, um, uh, be made. And for a, a common um, activity that you might have or a common um, interaction and you practice over and over and over. So for instance, an interaction that you might family members and they practice the script over and over. And again, the O collaborate out and, and um, practicing and doing it again and again. And sometimes please ask if you have any sort of said this. This is an example of a script, a written script. My name is Jim. I had a stroke. Talking is hard, but I can understand with extra time. And so this is a way, a script for him to try to help other people understand why he's taking a long time in responding. Um, it's basic and he practices it over and over and eventually it becomes more natural. There are computer versions. I know you can't read the, the left side, but the idea is that you listen to it and then you practice a sentence and you can practice with the computer. Now, as occupational therapists, this is our, um, our bread and butter. This is what we're great at, is participation as intervention. So it's interesting, there's this back and forth that once people are participating more in activities, they're also communicating more and getting that practice, but in a more natural setting. And so they go back and forth and then they want to participate more. Um, one study was about uh, participation in volunteer activities. And um, it's interesting because in a lot, of, in some of these studies, it's found that um, they, they had, uh, increased motivation to communicate and increased confidence. And I think also there's something about being a part of the community um, that's a, a piece of this too. So therapy groups are a way that this kind of participation can happen. The focus of the group may be on skills, but interestingly, sometimes they join, people join for that social participation and a chance to practice um, their, their communication. Here's some examples, some uh, photos of groups in this, um, in the top left is uh, a group and they're sharing collages about themselves that they created. The bottom is a games group. They're there to learn some skills, but they're also laughing, having fun together. And then this is a baking group, a cooking group. And these three gentlemen are um, baking cookies and they have to collaborate and work together to do that. So they have to ask for the cinnamon or the flour um, to make it happen. Adaptive strategies also, of course, are um, OT uh, specialty. Um, in this case, a client can use a phone um, to, or a, a camera to photograph a home environment um, so that the OT can make suggestions in ways to modify or adapt um, the home can also, and the um, 
the websites at the bottom here, aphasiaid.com. There are information cards that you can create for people with aphasia to carry with them that they can provide to people out in the community. Again, explaining that aphasia is an impairment of language, that it just takes them a little more time and to please be patient. So um, it's important for us to try to get the client perspective, even if someone has a communication impairment, to help support their participation in therapy and in their life activities. Um, there's usually a way to do that by adapting assessments um, and using some of these interventions and strategies that we talked about today. Thank you. Um, these are some of the resources that I mentioned. Um, the UK guidelines, that's freely accessible online. Um, and these are some of the assessments that are available for online for free that um, you may use with someone post-stroke or someone with um, some communication impairments. And goal attainment scaling is, um, it, you'd have to read some articles about how to do that one, because um, it's not just a, a one manual. And then I have lots of references here that I won't go through because there are, well, maybe I will. Look at that. There's a lot. Um, thank you, everybody. I'm going to go back to the question slide. Does anyone else have a question? Well, if you can't think of one right now, you can always email me and I will forward on that um, question to Dr. Escher. She has allowed me, I'll make a PDF of her presentation and I will be emailing that out uh, with a link to this recording. Yeah, for sure. Thank you Great. so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much um, for having me and for being here, everybody. I wish I could meet you all in person, but this is great. Well, yes, we actually have Uganda, Kenya, Kuwait, Guyana, UK, Nigeria. We, have, we were like, this is a pretty eclectic group here. We've got That's fantastic. I love it. That's great. <laughs> right, well, thank you, Anne, so much. And everyone else, stay on for just a minute, okay? I want to tell you something. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Take good care. Thank you. Bye-bye.